you boys get one life, and so far you've done a pretty good job of screwing it up. So, you're caveman now. Big shot, got a nickname. Well, let me tell you something, caveman. You are here on account of one person. You know who that person is? Yeah. Louis Satcher's Satcher's Satcher Satcher's Satcher Sats Sacagawea Sasha Sasha what the fuck I will survive I will endure when the going's rough you can't be sure I'll tough it out I won't give in if I'm not down I get up again As long as my In 1998, a writer known as Louis Sacher, this guy, published the book known as Holes, a story about a boy who is falsely accused of stealing and is sent to a camp where juvenile boys dig one hole each day for 18 months. Apparently, the book was so good that Andrew Davis wanted to direct the movie. Released in 2003, this movie was loved by fans who read the book, but this film was also really overlooked by a huge audience. Is this movie an underrated gem, or was it just made by a bunch of assholes? One way to find out, by checking out Holes. We start off in the desert where the boys are digging holes, but one nicknamed Barfag can't stand the heat no more, and let's just say he rattles his way back to jail. Barfag! We then cut to a pair of shoes being thrown on Shia LaBeouf's head. Hey, after the Transformers movies, it wouldn't surprise me if more things were thrown at his head. But anyway, LaBeouf plays the character Stanley Yelnats IV, a boy who believes he is always in the wrong place at the wrong time, and that his family is under a curse. The shoes belong to a famous baseball player named Clyde Livingston, who donated them to a children's orphanage, and because there isn't any proof that Stanley didn't steal them, he is sent to court. And this is basically a Super Mario Sunshine-esque kind of court. I mean, it's like... Court is now in session. As you are no doubt aware, someone has senselessly stolen Fair Clyde Livingston's shoes with some hands-like substance. The accused is charged with stealing the shoes, and yes, endangering our very way of life. Indeed! How can one not be aware of what is going on? Though it is not proven that he stole them, our orphans face a veil of shoelessness. Expert shoe scholars have determined that these shoes have been stolen because all of our guardians, the shoe sprites, have vanished from their gathering spot at the display case. The reason is quite obvious. This horrible shoe stealer is to blame. Notice this sketch of the perpetrator based on eyewitness descriptions. The truth is obvious, the guilty party sits among us. It is none other than Stanley Yelnats the Fourth. Um, objection, I think. Overruled, you're going to Camp Green Lake. So, you may or may not have noticed something wrong with this place. It's called Camp Green Lake, but there is no water. And it's not green. This is... Kinda sorta explained later. Sorta. But Stanley... By the way, if you're wondering why his last name is the Elnats, it's his first name spelled backwards. Meets Mr. Sir, played by John Voight, who is head of the dumbest name in the world club. A few things with him. He chews sunflower seeds because he gave up smoking. And yes, that is an ever so slight subplot. And anytime someone refers to him, they must call him by his name. My name is Mr. Sir. Whenever you speak to me, you will call me by my name. Is that clear? Yes, Mr. Sir. You think that's fine? Huh? I'm 
Mr. Sir. This is in the Girl Scout camp. Understand? Here. Well, you are a big trick. Thanks. Look, I know his name's Mr. Sir in the book, but that's like the most uncreative name I ever heard. It's like the writer couldn't think of a name for this character and said, Hey! What's a synonym for Mr.? We also meet Stanley's counselor, Hendansky. Yes, but I did not tell you to kidnap somebody. No, not you, Desky! Hendansky! Stanley Yelnats, I just want you to know that you may have done some bad things, but that does not make you a bad kid. <laughs> Welcome to Camp Greenlake. I'm Dr. Pendansky, your counselor. Uh, yeah, it does. So here's the lowdown on how Camp Greenlake works. Every day, the guys are to dig one hole each day, five feet deep, five feet in diameter. If anyone finds something interesting, they get the rest of the day off. But let's be honest, they're just here to build character. They help troubled youth build character. You're building character. Are we digging to build some character? Introduced to the boys of D-Tent. This is X-Ray. That's Armpit. This would be Squid. Not Word. This crazy guy they become Zigzag. And over here is we got Magnet. And the Silent One Zero. These are all nicknames that they call one another, which reflect what that particular person is like and or has done. For example, Rex over here is named X-Ray because, in an ironic fashion, his eyesight isn't that good, and Theodore is named Armpit because... Okay, that one should be obvious. Joe, my name is not Theodore. It's Armpit. And he takes that name with pride! And this is Zero. You want to know why they call him Zero? Because there's nothing going on in his stupid little head. Dr. Pendansky, once a great counselor, now about to become the president. Alright, so the easy day is over. Time to get cracked. Wow, this editor must have really liked crossfades, because he has like three shots crossfading at the same time. A guy who likes crossfading? That's just silly! While Stanley digs his hole, he starts daydreaming slash has a flashback about his grandpa telling him the story about Stanley Yelnats the Second, which is how this whole curse thing started. Yelnats the Second wants to marry this chick named Myra, but needs a big fat fucking pig to do so, and is in sort of competition against Igor over here. Not knowing what to do, he gets some help from Yzma from the Emperor's New Groove over here. Every day, you carry the pig up the mountain. Make it drink the water from the stream while you sing. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs. The bark on the tree was as soft as the sky. While the wood waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon. If only, if only. He manages to do this, but because Meyer is a schmuck. Sure, let's go with that. Yelnats insists that she marry Igor instead. He steals away, but forgetting a sort of important detail. If you forget to come back for Madame Zeroni. You and your family will be cursed for always and eternity. <laughs> so this flashback is over, and later that night... Don't move. Okay, that's not quite what happens. That was a yellow spotted lizard. Why are they so important? But you don't want to get bit by a yellow spotted lizard. 
That is the worst thing that can happen to you. You will die a slow and painful death. Ha! I'd be scared had I known they don't exist. All right, so as Stanley digs this hole, he thinks he found something interesting. Oh, but the warden don't like no fossils. Stanley, the warden isn't interested in fossils. As a wise man once told me, the warden isn't interested in fossils. The fossils of fish, which makes Stanley think that there was actually a lake out here. Guess there really was a lake out here once, right? It was a town, too. The warden's grandfather owned the lake and half the town. We fade into another flashback where we see what Green Lake was like before it dried up. Here we meet Sam, played by Dulay Hill, who is the nicest salesman ever who sells special onions where the juices make it so yellow spotted lizards don't attack anybody. Who may or may not look a little familiar from the beginning of the movie. I don't care how much gold there is back there, I ain't going back without some lizard juice. See, your friend back there wasn't so smart. Too bad he didn't know yellow spotted lizards don't like my onion juice. Other important characters we see here are Trout Walker, played by Scott Plank, and we also meet Miss Catherine, played by Patricia Arquette, who is good friends with Sam, and who Trout has a crush on, but she doesn't seem interested in him. The flashback stops here just to get us introduced to these three characters. And X-Ray makes a deal with Stanley. Look, man, you ever find anything? Give it to me, you understand? I've been here for over six months and never found anything. No one has. Why should you get a day off when you just got here? You know what I'm saying? It's only fair, right? And in a few days, he finds something. A skinny container looking thing with the initials KB. KB? Yeah, yeah, that's Keith Barringer. Man, who's that? He was in my math class. The next day, X shows up to Bonansky and calls up the warden. Right over there. Hello, Sigourney. Haven't seen you in a while. Yep. Sigourney Weaver plays the warden. All right. So Mr. Sir's thing is everyone calling him by his name whenever He's they speak funny. to him. Pendanski makes fun of Zero a lot, yes, and the warden's is. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. And I'm not even kidding. That is her running joke. Her saying, excuse me? They spend the rest of the day digging as a team rather than individually. So clearly the warden's looking for something, but we just don't know what it is. And on top of that, X didn't find the container in his hole. After the digging, we enter in the flashback again where it's raining and Catherine and Sam are just... Talking. I thought you might still want some onions. Thank you. I can fix that. Sam, are you going to try to tell me now that your onions are a cure for a leaky roof? So they spend day after day with moving. one another. But you may or may not see some problems with this. Trout likes Catherine. Catherine certainly likes Sam as more than a friend. And Sam is black, which, in this time period, was a serious taboo for people of two different races to be together. This doesn't make Trout the happiest customer. And we get probably the most perverted sheriff to ever exist. Give me a kiss. You kiss the onion picker. Get drunk! I always get drunk before hanging. If you hang him, then you better hang me too. Because I kissed him back. It ain't against the law for you to kiss him. Just for him to kiss you. Now the next thing that we see is... But the next time we see her, she seems like she's recovered a bit. Oh! And 
And this is her thing. Killing someone, then kissing them on the cheek. So the flashback ends and we cut back to the guys. They're getting their canteens refilled, where nothing suspicious is going on. Nothing bad is happening. If anything bad were to happen, it definitely not happen in this scene, cause let's be honest, the boys are building character, and as we all know, when you build character, nothing bad happens. He's coming back. He's coming back? You mean to tell me that he would never figure out that the bag of sunflower seeds he chews cause he quit smoking is missing? Yeah, I believe it. So after these traitors toss the bag in Stanley's hole, shut up. He doesn't do a very subtle job of hiding it, he gets caught, and Mr. Sir gets the bright idea to bring him to Warden Weaver. Remember how I said before that the sunflower seeds were an ever so small subplot? Well, uh, while Mr. Sir was filling our canteens, I snuck into his truck and uh, s stole his sunflower seeds. The warden is obviously annoyed because Mr. Sir said Stanley found something interesting and in the warden's eyes, that means something special, which a bag of sunflower seeds aren't. So warden has Stanley get nail polish made with a secret ingredient. Rattlesnake venom. And... <laughs> Mr. Sir becomes Spider-Man and gets nailed by Venom. <laughs> Woo! Ah, thank you. Thank you all. I thank all of you for coming out tonight. And this makes Mr. Sir hate Stanley and do stuff like this. Something the matter with my face? No. No, Mr. Sir. I think we just learned a valuable lesson. We're all people, and Mr. Sir is a very sensitive man. Dr. Pendanski for the people. But Stanley is let go and gets quite a surprise when he gets back. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Don't look at us. Yeah, zero. Zero finished digging gold. Stanley's hole. Shut up for him since he was innocent for not stealing the bag. And some other things. Why'd you dig my hole, man? You just stole the sunflower seeds. Yeah, but neither did you. You didn't steal the shoes. Also, while Stanley was looking for the nail polish, he noticed some news articles with the name of a wanted criminal named Kissing Kate Barlow. This has Stanley thinking. Remember that gold tube? Yeah. I think that the tube it was a tube of lipstick. And the KB stands for Kate Barlow. Kissing Kate Barlow? Kissing Kate Barlow. Then we get a flashback montage of Kate doing criminalish stuff. While this montage isn't exactly needed, I still like it, and the song I Will Survive fits pretty well with it. I will survive, I will do, when the going's rough, you can be sure, I'll tough it out, I won't give in, if I'm not down, I'll get up again. But Zero tries to make a deal with Stanley. He'll take a part of Stanley's hole every day, and Stanley teaches Zero how to read. This upsets the other guys, and word gets to Mr. Sir, Pendanski, and Warden. You know, a caveman sits around and does nothing. Excuse me? Caveman digs his hole just like everyone else. Sometimes. Excuse me? Ma'am, Zero's been digging a part of caveman's hole every day. You're not digging holes no more? I'm not digging any more holes. Good. Wow. Okay, that I gotta see repeated. <laughs> but Zero can't take any more of Camp Green Lake and runs off. No, I'm not pouting. I'm just asking, are we sure that he had no family? He was a ward of the state. He was living on the streets when he was arrested. Is there some prissy caseworker who might ask questions? He had nobody. He was nobody. No one cares about Hector Zeroni. Dr. Pendanski, the world's greatest camp counselor, to become the president soon enough. After a few 
days go by, we get introduced to a new character who doesn't serve much purpose in the movie. Twitch. Okay, I take that back. Twitch does have a purpose in this movie. Because he's a joyriding freak, and that's what got him sent to Camp Green Lake in the first place, he teaches Stanley how to joyride and, you know, hack people's cars and... Shit. <laughs> Stanley steals Mr. Sir's car and he drives off into a hole. And this causes him to run off now. And he manages to come across Zero. But his cell ain't looking too good since he's been out for a day or two. And then they spot something in the distance. Word. Is that not right there? That one? Yeah. Huh. What does that look like to you? Yeah, I kind of sort of forgot to mention this part. You see, a long time ago, Stanley Yelnes the first was attacked by Kate Barlow and was left in the desert to die. But then he found this mountain God's Thumb and survived. So Stanley and Zero get to the top of the mountain, and now we know what Zero is all about. I stole the shoes. I didn't know there were sweet feet. And also, as this explanation goes on, there's some really nice music in the background. To the homeless shelter. And I saw the shoes and I just... I liked them. I didn't know they were famous. Next thing I know, everyone's bugging out. The shoes are gone, the shoes are gone, where are the shoes? Walking down the street and I heard the sirens coming after me. I got scared. So we get our last flashback of Kate Barlow. Apparently Trout really wants to find the treasure, but Kate's not gonna deliver the details that easily. Oh yeah, and remember when I said earlier that it's kinda sorta explained why the lake dried up and the town kinda went to crap? Well! Well, it's all gone now. Two? <laughs> it's dried up with the lake. Hasn't rained here since the day they killed Sam. So yeah, apparently Sam was the thing putting Camp Green Lake together, and when they killed him off, the lake said, we don't like these people. But Barlow can't take not being with Sam anymore, and it just finds a lizard. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Sir, what did you say earlier? I find two words wrong with that statement. Because first off, you die a slow and painful death. Looks like she's laughing all the way through. And I don't know, that death happened pretty quick. You never studied. Apparently I didn't. Alrighty then, so Stanley and Zero figure there might actually be something interesting in the hole that Stanley dug where he dug a giant rock out of it. Or the one where he found Kate Barlow's lipstick too. And they find something. Thank you, boys. You've been a big help. Oh, get back! Oh my God! Oh, 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 oh. But the lizards aren't gonna harm Stanley and Zero because when they are on God's thumb, they are eating nothing but onions. Coincidentally, onions that have a special juice in them that prevents yellow-spotted lizards from biting you. But we find out who the treasure belongs to. You see? Stan Lee Yell Nets. He, he can't read. So apparently Mr. Sir Pendansky and the Warden are getting arrested. Because Mr. Sir is in possession of a gun that he is illegally holding. Dr. Pendansky is not a doctor. Nah, what gave you that impression? And I guess the Warden just... 
Ron's a bad camp, and I guess she was about to steal the young Nats's treasure. There might have been some difficulties with that. Speaking of, in case you're wondering, we already found out that her first name was Lou earlier in the movie. Hey, Lou. But we never really found out a last name. The warden's last name is Walker. That last name sound familiar at all? Yes, the warden is the grandchild of Trout Walker. What's that? But it's finally raining at Camp Green Lake, and Stanley and Hector get to go home. And that's how the great great grandson of Elia Yelnats and the great 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 grandson of Madame Zeroni came next door neighbors. And they have a party with the other juvenile boys. I guess you have to fill in the rest of the holes yourself. You know, I gotta admit, for a movie called Holes, you'd expect a lot of plot holes to be in the movie, wouldn't you? But there's really not. For whatever reason, this movie has been really overlooked. I don't know if it's because people really want to see the movie because they read the book and they want to see if the movie's as close to the book as they hope it is, but you never really hear anybody talk about this movie. To me, it seems rather interesting that not a lot of people talk about this. But we have to conclude this review somehow. So what worked in holes and what didn't? The Adaptation When anyone thinks movie based off of a book, they immediately think either the movie will in no way relate to the source material, or leave out important details that were important in the book. That is not the case with this one. The only discontinuity error I could find in this was Stanley himself. But that doesn't really count as a con. In the book, Stanley was supposed to be overweight at the beginning, and as time went on, he would lose weight. The writers rightfully thought that it'd be kind of rude to try to get an overweight kid to star in this and force him to lose weight. But everything else is pretty dead on perfect. The locations, the flashbacks, and even most of the lines. My name is Mr. Sir. Whenever you speak to me, you will call me by my name. That clear? This is Sir. In fact, if you've read the book, you may know that there is a scene where Stanley daydreams that he gets picked on by a bully at school and the other guys defend him. They actually filmed that, but had to make it a deleted scene. If you haven't seen this movie, and you're one of those people who gets agitated when movies based off books always miss things and you wonder if there's any movie out there that can actually do it right, this would be the one for you. The Boys of Detent. And no, I'm not talking about their music group. What can I say about them? None of them felt out of place and they all get a decent amount of screen time. If you recall, this is a problem I had with Twister in some of the Storm Chaser supporting cast. Sure, there are a few of them that had really memorable lines and they were just all around memorable. But then there was the rest of them that just kind of felt like they were left in the dust and they didn't really do a whole lot. But you don't get that here. Each of the boys of Detent get their own screen time, and they actually communicate with one another. There's not a whole lot more I can say about them, except that they are an awesome supporting cast. The Flashbacks. Some might think they can be rushed, and happen out of nowhere, and I really only agree with that for the very last flashback where Barlow kills herself, and maybe the very first one. But even then, I don't think they're bad. I like how the first flashback is showing how the Yelnats family had this curse set upon them. Yeah, this one may seem a bit rushed, as there's not a whole lot of time in between to make us say, WAIT! GO BACK! I WANT TO SEE WHAT HAPPENS! But it's still enjoyable to know what happens. The second one shows us what Green Lake was like back in the old days. This one especially keeps on your toes on what happens, the way it introduces the characters of Miss Catherine, Sam, and Trout, and shows what happened to them. The Warden, Mr. Sir, and Pendanski. Honestly, it took me a while to warm up to them. I was actually gonna put Pendanski on the con list, but decided against it, because 
He's the kind of character who you love to hate. But on top of that, Penansky, John Voight, and Sigourney Weaver look like they're having fun in their roles. Make you pay for it. Now you're truck. accusing me of doing something. You think I did this in my own you truck? You left the keys inside of a truck in front of a bunch. This is a juvenile work camp with juvenile delinquents. Don't get me heated because I don't insult A truck with a tank full of gas? I said get me a wrench. Did I say get me a wrench? I'll get you a wrench. Get me a wrench. Read my lips. Get me a wrench. I'm getting it, you sideburn Neanderthal. I ain't here to be a mechanic. Don't you throw nothing at me. I will say I never pictured Mr. Sir to look like this the first time I saw it. Believe it or not, I thought this guy was going to be Mr. Sir because... No joke, that's how I pictured him in the book. And yeah, Warden's enjoyable too. At the beginning, she is a threatening, strict woman who will excuse you to hell. But by the end, she's just so desperate and you just want to laugh in her face. Once again, it was not easy for me to find cons in this movie. When I try to find a con, it can't be a nitpick. It has to be something or multiple things that literally do not make the movie work. So with that said, Twitch. He serves only one purpose in the movie, and book for that matter. Help Stanley hijack Mr. Sir's truck. He has maybe three lines in the movie, appears a little ways into the third act, so there's not a whole lot of time to get to know him or have the others interact with him. Even in the book, he just seemed kinda out of nowhere. The court scene. This might seem like a nitpick, but it really isn't. The idea of sending someone to court means the person accused of committing a crime gets a chance to defend him or herself and prove that they are not guilty and of course the dog's gotta bark at them. The idea of sending someone to court means the person accused of committing a crime gets a second chance to defend him or herself and prove that they are not guilty. Yeah, earlier I did make a joke comparing it to Mario Sunshine and that was a pretty fast paced court. And it's just like, HE DID IT! Alright, clean Delfino Island, or in this case it would be dig at Camp Green Lake. But oddly enough, this isn't the only relation because for one, there is no jury, two, there is no evidence presented that it was Stanley who stole them, yes he was seen running with them, but there's no actual proof that he robbed the orphanage. Four, this court has a grand total of six people in it. They being Stanley, his dad, his grandpa, his mom, Clyde, and the judge. And five, Stanley has no say in the matter. Yes, his folks said they couldn't afford to hire a lawyer. But Stanley doesn't even get a chance to defend himself. Sure, the only thing he could really say is, I didn't take them. And it would be one of those cases where no one would believe him still, but like the phrase goes, innocent until proven guilty. But here, it's guilty until proven innocent. Also something I've heard that others say what makes this movie bad are little to no action scenes. I personally don't think this is a con though. Sure, the most action scenes are the Kate Barlow flashbacks, but I think people often forget or don't realize that this movie doesn't really need action scenes. The main focus is on Stanley and how he survives in this camp. It's one of those cases where the characters are what keep your attention. The best example I can give is Ghostbusters. There are not that many action scenes in it, but it's the Ghostbusters that make the story happen and make it enjoyable. And while Holes may not have as funny or have as many memorable characters as Ghostbusters, this does not make Holes a bad movie at all. In fact, I dare even give this movie a 7 out of 10. One point for every member of Detent.